Our presenter is Ashish Sharma from Berkeley Labs, and he is presenting Detecting Credential Spear Phishing Attacks at LBNL. Welcome, Ashish. My name is Ashish Sharma. I'm from Berkeley Lab, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, credential spear phishing attacks at LBNL. Uh, the deal is, uh, it actually is a little more refined now. It's going to be more of inside baseball. The real credential spear phishing attacks, actually, uh, you, you guys should go and read this Usenix paper, which actually talks about all the theory and the technology and uh, all the underlying bases and heuristics and analysis. This, this talk, actually, I kind of designed around bro-centric, to be bro-centric, like all the uh, things we were doing to implement this paper inside using bro for trying to figure out how to get a reasonable L to a reasonable alerting level. So um, these are typical uh, slides which we always put in with our uh, talks. So Berkeley Lab, uh, I think the best part here to brag about is birthplace of bro. So, uh, uh, and then the second is this one, uh, 13 Nobel Prizes, so it's there. And then uh, there are like all kinds of different research facilities at the lab. So lab is actually a conglomeration of different uh, little, little labs, there's molecular foundry, ALS, and so on. And I think they actually, a bunch of uh, elements were discovered at the lab back in like 50s, 60s, and so on. So, so we are hiring, uh, this is the URL uh, noted down, we'll definitely, if you are interested in Bro, we are interested in you. So, <laughs> uh, so here's the overview, this is a very, Rough overview, I could not summarize the talk because it kept changing. But uh, I want to talk about current state of SMTP and then like gaining visibility into SMTP itself, is, I think was a pretty uh, good contribution overall. And then there was like all these new scripts and then uh, they creating false positives and then we actually started working on like uh, detecting credential spare phishing and then how that real-time detector works and then how do you deal with persistence and scalability and like all those different, so there are deployment challenges and so on and so forth. But so this is actually the mail flow architecture at the lab. So like mail comes in here, goes through iron port, no first goes through Google domain, so we are a Google shop, complete Google shop. So we literally have to log into gmail.lbl.gov to actually, and then we have a Gmail interface. So, and then we use iron ports as well. So like mail comes from Google, goes to iron port, does their own filtering, goes back to Google and then it goes out. So where do we, uh, and actually it's uh, image is uh, created by Derek, the great Johnson, who is our mail admin. Uh, so we actually have bro somewhere here, which actually sees all these emails going in and coming in and going out. So. So that way we do have all kinds of visibility into the mail traffic. So, uh, and then we do all conventional things. We would actually like, we are completely Gmail, we have iron ports. I think these are the, uh, if not the best out there, one of the best technologies in email setup as of now. Then we actually have phishing spe specific security training. We do simulated phishing exercise, which is an opt-in exercise. Uh, and then uh, we do RPG, we actually continuously keep testing other vendors. So we have tested FireEye, we have tested a bunch of other uh, security appliance, email appliances. And turns out that they generally are like more concentrating on attachment analysis rather than URLs and so on and so forth. So all, after all this conventional thing, actually the fish makes in and uh, this is a PDF, so you don't see the animation, but there is actually a fish flying over and hits this guy's face. I'll show you, show it to you later. But yeah, this is what, uh, this is what actually we see often, and I think this would be familiar to a lot of people. Uh, like uh, all this, like Gmail, AOL, like oh yeah, one-stop shop for all the accounts, and same here, same here. So this is familiar territory for a lot of people here. Uh, but here is the deal: uh, these are also real phishing pages. So uh, this one is uh, like, you cannot quite read it, but they are like very different domains where they actually just replicated our uh, login page. So, and we keep dealing with them. Like, so, so what I am talking about is the work which is actually supplemental to the existing technologies. So we really, uh, like we have vast majority of protections already from Gmail, iron ports, 
and our mail filtering, our rules on the iron ports. But what we are trying to do is let's find that one little thing which actually just goes through and that one little thing actually becomes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let, let's, can, can we catch all this stuff here? So, so this diagram is actually, this slide is going to be there for next uh, quite a few slides, but this is basically the representation of the entire fishing expedition. So it happens in like very, like three straightforward ways. Either there is a link, there is a clear email which actually sh says give us money, or there is an attachment which can be a bad malicious attachment. Now with link there is possibility of like a web form, so you click on the link, they, it gives you a login page, you give your credentials, they log in as you. Uh, or there is redirection, which actually results in web form. And there's sometimes there are seven redirections. So redirection, redirection, re finally it's a web form. Or it's a download. If it's a download, it actually goes back to PDF, Word, or macros. So, so basically this represents the entire thing. So the question actually comes is, like, oh yeah, here are some examples. So this is a real email. This, is, this uh, used to be our lab director. So somebody said, just send us $15,000. So, but yeah, I mean, they sent it to the wrong person. Lab director doesn't deal with 15. Like, if they would have asked 150 million or something, it might have been. So, uh, again, like, this is example of the credential phishing. So, we actually had this one too. And then uh, here is uh, the attachment one where we actually would see, yeah, there is this malicious attachment, and then we would actually submit it to SOFOS. And this is from my mailbox. So, if you see, like, we had like five different uh, new signatures created by SOFOs on attachments we submitted to SOFOs in August. So this is a fairly frequent thing. I think SOFOs probably start, uh, there are some people there who know our name now. So, but uh, this is the current state of the attack. So this is the current state of Bro. This is the SMTP log. Everybody is familiar with it, I suppose. So what this does is it, it's a pretty comprehensive log. There are so many of these uh, fields in there and it gives you a reasonably decent visibility. So, but the pro it's like there is a timestamp, sender, subject, mail from, in, in fact even this thing is pretty cool. This is the path in which the mail traveled and then user agent like is this PHP, is it like uh, something else, what's going on? So, but this still does not give us reasonable visibility into the uh, attacks. So, we need more visibility. We need like uh, we need ability to log all the URLs in the email. We need ability to track them. We need ability to see if these URLs get clicked on. So the current stock bro wasn't giving me all this visibility. So here's the deal. Like I want, this is the attack. So if attack is link based, let's extract all the URLs. Let's track those clicks. Uh, let's see if there is an HTTP post in there. If there is a, a credential, like is it a, credential which actually is our LDAP credential or is it something like a random password for a bank or like what's what's going on if there is a file download do we have all the hashes with it if it's actually some attachment like let's extract the files put them in the sandbox if there are all these different indicators which generally come from the Intel feed uh, like we should identify these indicators and just like push them up into the bro so that bro can actually start generating alerts on it so, so this is where the deal is. So like, okay, let's extract URLs now. How do you do that? Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. Uh, mo this is the uh, workhorse here. So you call this event MIME data all, uh, and then you say find all the URLs. And then uh, basically if there is a link in URL, so basically just traverse this entire uh, uh, data structure and then say, okay, fire this event called process SMTP URLs. So the reason I actually said, okay, let's fire this because I wanted to do multiple things in process SMTP URL. Uh, one of them is logging, but then there were other things which I would like to do with processing the URL. So process URL does log SMTP URL. Now you can actually overload this event again for some other task and then some other task and so on and so forth. So, and then log all URLs is literally like, okay, I'm gonna populate this data structure, and then I would say log. So it's fairly straightforward. So I think the, this is how uh, log of all the URLs look like. So you have timestamp, you have unique identifier, which actually matches the SMTP record, which actually goes and matches the connection record. Then you have this source destination port. This is the domain of all the URLs, and this is actually the URL. And uh, do you guys see a pattern here? I wish the logs were just like this, like only badness, nothing else. 
So, but this is I cherry picked the data. I grabbed on Dropbox.htm and got it. But we had a campaign. We actually had a bunch of emails come up with these different URLs for all these domains. What do we do? We actually take all these domains and we would RPG them immediately. So, but the workhorse of like find all URLs is actually this regular expression, and Seth actually gave me this one. If Seth would not have given me this, this thing would not have worked. So. <laughs> So yeah, like you take this regular expression and then bro would match this regular expression and then put it in the URL's data structure. So and then bro takes care of logging uh, uh, and then logging framework is independent of clusterization, so on. So yeah. And so this this wouldn't necessarily be visible if the the SMTP was TLS encrypted, right? Yes, that is true. Okay. So so for that actually, like there are multiple strategies people are using. So what we enforce is that we actually don't do TLS as of now. But we are looking at another architecture where we would actually put bro behind TLS. So. Or like I think uh, somebody else actually takes their uh, iron ports and just forwards the mail in clear text to another collector and then put bro in between. So, so uh, yeah, so OK, so let's, we have all the URLs from the email. Now can we actually start tracking the clicks? Do we know if this URL got clicked on? So let's, we can do that too. The problem is clusterization. And I think I, I had this all stuff written before, but that, that was all standalone that time because I didn't know how to clusterize. The problem comes here is that the email which actually has this URL comes on worker 10. Somebody clicks on it, that goes on worker 15. So we need to make sure that the URLs are actually seen on the worker which is processing that particular HTTP request. So this becomes a mess, like okay, this URL gets seen here, this URL gets seen here, and so on and so forth. So how do we do it? So the idea here is, well, you clusterize, you take all the URLs from all the workers and send it to all the workers. That works. So, uh, and uh, this, this is rough diagram, but it literally is like, okay, you would get the data here, you say, okay, process URLs. If that URL is in a Bloom filter, you just say, okay, I'm gonna exit out. Uh, I'll tell you the story behind the Bloom filters. If it's in the table, uh, well, exit out. If it's not, add it to the table and then send it to manager. Manager actually does the same thing and sends it back to the worker. And the reason manager does it is because if, let's say, same email goes to different, like there can be 10 copies of that email, different workers process it. So all workers report to manager, but manager says, oh, I have sent this already to all the workers. I'm not going to send the same URL again. So that's kind of a uh, optimization strategy. But another one is that, let's say, uh, I have 600,000 URLs in email every day. I need to expire them. I cannot keep them in the table. So I use Bloom filter to actually keep those URLs in the uh, Bloom filter and only a limited set of URLs in the table. So that way I can actually keep up with the memory. I don't have to worry about uh, like uh, how much RAM is each box or worker going to take. So, so now there is a new log as well. The log actually is SMTP clicked URLs.log. So it actually says this was the connection, this was the like entire source destination, this was the URL uh, domain, this was the URL, and this was the original email with the sender, recipient, and subject, which actually resulted in the click. So you know the click, you know the URL, and you know the source of the URL as well. So this, this is basically, we are logging it for pretty much everything now. So, so that actually is part two. Now part three is like, okay, so somebody clicks on it, they enter their password. Can we actually track their passwords now? Uh, can we see HTTP posts? Of course, it has to be clear text. Now, if it's encrypted, like if it's HTTPS, there are other tricks to do, like tap into uh, SSL analyzer to see if the certs are new or old. You can actually tap into DNS logs to see if this domain is actually seen before or not. But here is how uh, you would track HTTP posts. You need to run Jim Melander's HTTP post uh, script. So what I did is actually Jim gave me the script years and years ago, like I, I don't remember, like five, six, seven years ago. So I said, uh, I'm just gonna extend the script to actually start incorporating uh, SMTP related data into HTTP analyzer space. And that way I know that this URL is an SMTP URL, it was in an email, now it got clicked on, and because it got clicked on, there was an HTTP sensitive post request where there was a username entered and there was a password entered. And then I literally uh, like extended this a little further 
to say if password meets a certain complexity. If it does not meet a, meet a complexity, we don't care. But if it meets the complexity enforced by lab, then we actually say, then yeah, this is a sensitive password. We need to follow up with the user, see if it's uh, actually a real legit password or it's some other thing going on. So then we actually came up with another alert, which is a sensitive URI, where it's like, OK, this is simple signature matching. If URL has this string, generate an alert. Flat simple. This is mostly used when the people are using phishing toolkits. They would have uh, stock uh, URLs for different domains. And then you are like, OK, yeah, I know this one. Let me generate an alert. So uh, this works fairly OK as long as you don't get too liberal on uh, putting things in there. So then files types, MD5 hashes, this, this is all provided by files.log and the file analysis framework, which actually is pretty good. But what I wanted to do was, can we generate an alert if a URL in an email gets clicked on, which results in a file download? So yes, so I actually sent an email to myself. This is all the like command line at Gmail said, OK, you should run Putty. So somebody sent this link to Putty. When you click on the link and the file gets downloaded, we actually get this alert like it's a file. But uh, so there are MIME types where we, you can say, like, if the files are PDF, RAR, JPEG, uh, sorry, uh, TAR, GZ, or any other thing. So you can choose, pick and choose what files get downloaded and what alerts you want to generate. But yeah, we can actually get this capability. And this is all clusterized, so it works fairly well overall. So uh, that actually. Uh, gets me to the last part, which was actually identify the indicators of compromise, where you get all these different uh, known knowns, like, OK, uh, I have a feed. There are these malicious senders, subject, attachment, receipts, all kinds of different things. So I said, you know what? Uh, let's create a new policy. Uh, we have all this data. There, it's sitting in different directories. I wrote a cron, which literally just goes and grabs through all these like, hundreds of directories and finds this email indicators and then just dumps it into a flat file. So the file doesn't care if it's actually a sender. It doesn't classify subjects, attachment, MD5. And then I said, you know, volume is not that high. I'm just going to match all these indicators against everything in the SMTP log record. So that way, I actually see a malicious mail from, malicious from, reply to, subject, path, and receipt to. So we will have, the idea was that, you know, if things match, everything should light up like a Christmas tree. So, so, but this is more of an automated process where just cron takes care of things. And this is known, known. So uh, gaining visibility. So all this part actually gets us more visibility into the SMTP analysis stuff. Uh, oh, sorry, phishing. Uh, but here is the performance thing. So here are the number of alerts. So this is a little deceptive. Like This is actually a graph for all the different specific things, but this is only for subject. So this gets divided here. But these are independent, like how many sensitive URI alerts goes up to 300 sometimes. So this sensitive post is 150. So the numbers were pretty high. Uh, so it's like, OK, these are this is good visibility, but alerts are just too high. Like on a random day, and like talk about it, I chose a random day which was really high. So <laughs> there were 272 alerts that day. So we needed to like figure out optimization makes system smarter. And so I also said, OK, like, let's see how many emails we get, how many URLs are in there. And it's just an interesting observation that the number of URLs we collect in a day is roughly 10 times the number of emails we get. So this graph here is the number of emails. So it's like 400,000. So it's roughly 500,000 max. The number of URLs you get is actually uh, 6 million. Right, yeah. So it's like, OK, what's going on? So here's the deal. You want, you have all this data, you have all these URLs, but you want that one URL that was phishing URL, and actually specifically that spare phishing URL, which is after your credentials. So that is literally a needle in a haystack. So those 272 alerts get boring, and you would miss it. So th that was the time to bring big guns, uh, which was like smart people. OK, let's get smartness in the system. And I am not kidding you. Like uh, the people I worked with are there was there was too much brain power there. So, so like let's identify credential spare fish. So the like idea here is that the base rates are high. So if you have 500,000 emails a day with 0.1 percent false positive, you still have 500 alerts. 
So generally, we get like 50 to 100. Uh, uh, like most of the people in my team don't even look at them because 50 to 100 every day is just too much. So, but the primary reason of all these alerts is either it's actually lure centric, where it's like it was all concentrated on this email, or it was all concentrated on the badness of, of the file download. So it was an exploit centric. So this was independent. So the big idea was like, okay, let's actually combine both of them together. So here are some examples, clear cut examples. So like. This entire impersonation of like phishing attacks where somebody actually exploits a trust, gets you to actually uh, lure you into clicking on something and then uh, think that they are legitimate, but they are not. So there can be an address spoofer, and this is the real data. So like uh, our director, Paul Alivisatos, so it, actually they sent it as like A Alivisatos, but they spoofed the address. And then they are like, okay, send the money. This was the historically new attacker where this was like computer maintenance, and there was, there is no account like that at the lab. So they actually created this account, which was totally historically new. Then somebody spoofed the name. So this was Secretary of Energy. But the email was somebody's original. And this was where somebody actually compromised an account. And they would log into the Gmail interface, and then they would send emails out. And if you get an email from Ashish, you better open it. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is, here is, this is real example, I, I just thought, okay. So when somebody reported, Bro did not detect this one, we got reported into. So somebody reported, so we actually logged into their Gmail interface. And what we see is that this bad guy is actually composing an email to send out. Uh, so here is all these different addresses. There are 398 BCCs here. And then this was the malicious link and this all. And then uh, this was in the draft. So, so, but uh, we are like, huh, what's, this is interesting. And here is the list. So, so they're composing and we log in there and then we immediately log the account out and control. So, but this was actually where, uh, this is one of those rare things where you actually catch a culprit in action. But actually, let me rephrase, you catch culprit's action, not culprit. So, but uh, yeah, so, so this was, this is a pretty, dense slide, but I wanted to keep it for my sake so that I can remember what exactly is going on here. So, so one of the big uh, idea was like, okay, let's divide the, uh, like, let's combine together the exploit-centric uh, nature of uh, phishing expedition and the lure-centric nature. So exploit-centric is where the, like, you look, start looking at the domain reputation features, like, okay, this URL has this domain. Now, is this domain actually, uh, what is the likelihood that somebody actually visited that URL based on the FQDN? So like lb, password.lbl.gov is where you would go, but like password.lbl.gov.hackme.com is not where you would go. So like what is the likelihood of going there? And then you start figuring out like, okay, how many people have visited that? Uh, and then what is the global count of uh, this particular domain? Like how many times it has been seen in the past? So most often than not, domains are new. And if they have very less history to it, they actually are facilitate our heuristics. And then like, if employees have never visited that domain or if the number of days between the first visit and today uh, or when the link got clicked. So, but, but the interesting thing is when you're look, looking at like, can you count the number of days between the first visit and the time when the link in the URL got clicked on, you can implement that logic in Bro. Like, this is fairly long stretch of things. So likewise, when you get into the lure-centric part where you actually start creating the sender reputation feature, so you have name spoofer, where you actually count how many time, uh, number of days a from contains the same name as the email being sent on. So like how many times you get an email with the name Ashish Sharma, irrespective of what the address was. So likewise, if you have email from somebody, but the address is mine, and so on and so forth. So there is all these different uh, features which we, use, we start investigating into. And this is how we actually started designing this real-time detector where uh, you would have uh, email in, uh, Bro would see an email, it would extract all these URLs and go through this entire URL click process, but at the same time it would extract all these features and create this reputation database for sender, sender name, sender address, and then name and address together. So there would be all three of them. And likewise, when you see an HTTP request, you actually get construct the get request, see if it's actually 
a get request which matches the table which contains all the URLs in an email and then process the click event, but then you create this reputation. Depending on all the heuristics, logics, features, you actually generate this rare URL click or you generate all these different alerts. So now the feature vectors actually get a little more interesting. So when Grant actually uh, sent me this, like he worked hard on all this stuff, he would crunch all these millions and millions of log lines and emails and then come up with this, like, you know, like what seems pretty simple, like for example, if it's a rare URL and the number of days sent is less than two, and if the number of, like from address is actually less than equals to two, then we can call it a historically new attacker. I'm like, that is simple. It's like, yeah, but he crunched 350 million emails to come up with this heuristic. There was a lot of machine learning involved. There was a lot of stuff. So, but the deal is, uh, the final version of the paper actually even gets rid of these parameters. So, like, these are fragile, like, two, it may work here, it may not work at other places, uh, and uh, it may work for today, but may not work, uh, two, like, a year down the line. So, these are fragile. So, the final version, like, the uh, uh, just gets rid of all this and comes up with something even better. So. So this, this entire graph, it got replaced with directed anomaly scoring. That is a DAS. It's a system which actually uh, would allow you to reduce the number of alerts, but make sure, no, it actually allows you to prioritize the alerts and then define how many alerts do you want to see. So it would, uh, the bro would actually have all the alerts and then I, I can say I want only to see only 10. So it would actually say, okay, these are the tens which are which we think are really bad. But you know the deal is, I implemented whatever is the background. But that is the part of working on the cutting edge research. Like things keep evolving. So uh, I will be working on the DAS implementation in the next few weeks. So, but. Uh, what DAS does is like they, it does not read, need any training data, and the reason is because how many really critical spare fishes did we get in last five years? So the number is like eight or seven. So you cannot really have a training data for seven, like which were really targeted spare fishes. So it actually does not need training data. It operates in non-parametric fashion. And then the order of magnitude better performance than standard anomaly detection. So it actually gives us a lot more power and in a better fashion. So. The alerts were just too damn high, like 272 goes down to like, okay, I want to see only less than equals to 10 alerts, and I want to make sure that these are very fast to deal with. So this entire thing actually is, uh, the paper, I just created a short link, but if you go here, the paper actually explains things 10 times better than what I actually did here. Uh, so it's a good read to do. So now comes, like next few slides are the challenges I was facing in deploying uh, heuristics from uh, all this uh, uh, research work. So like, okay, how do you create this domain sender and recipient features? Uh, how do you optimize URLs in Bro? Like we get 600,000 URLs a day. How do you deal with that? And make sure that like you keep state across the days and like Bro cannot crash or restart. That doesn't work. So that's where comes Bro plus, plus Postgres. That works pretty well. So what I did is, and Johanna actually like uh, told me about it. I'm like, huh, this this is good. Let's try it out. So first I tried SQL Lite. Turns out SQL Lite has its problems. Like it actually does table layer locking. We need row level locking. So that's why we had to move to Postgres because like uh, like Bro would try to write so many URLs in one moment, and so Postgres hand, can handle pretty well. So you install this Bro package. You tell Bro uh, talk to Postgres, and what this talk to Postgres process does is it literally takes this bro record and translates it into Postgres one to one. So you can actually have a vector of time or set of addresses and that would actually become transparently uh, converted into Postgres. So it works flawlessly well. So, and this is how actually a particular record looks like. So this particular domain, when we actually start like creating history for uh, reputation for it. It's like how many days it has visited, unique days, and how many requests, and how, what was the last time. So this all gets stored in Postgres. When Bro restarts, it reads everything from Postgres, and, and it's all geared up and ready. So there were design decisions like, okay, what, what is the maximum size of the mail links table you can have? Like, can you store 
uh, uh, so I counted like there are uh, actually here I think in the next slide so I counted there were about 25 million unique URLs in 43 days of data collection you cannot keep all of them in the table so we actually keep everything in the Postgres but we actually have a bloom filter and bloom filter allows like if there is a hidden bloom filter you actually make bro go to the Postgres fetch up that particular specific email which actually had that URL so but what this allowed us to do is that instead of like fighting and struggling to figure out like can I st like oh I, I would think that a phishing email would actually get clicked on in within four hours no oh maybe within 12 hours so that troubles went away actually this work worked rather too good so we would actually have so many URLs that I actually had to limit it to 30 days because now I can actually store six months of data and I broke and actually go and fetch that yeah this email was sent in March 3rd and this was this URL was there so I actually limited it so that when bro is reading the data it doesn't actually go and read six months of the data so then there were all these design decisions about like, okay, FQDL, like, okay, how many times you can make database query? Can you actually query on every click? Like, so one idea was like, okay, you need to create reputation for the domain in the URL. So if you see that domain in the, U, uh, like in extracted uh, URL, should bro actually go and pull that information from database so that it's like, oh, I am ready. Somebody is going to click it, so I already have all the data. Or should it happen after the fact that the click happened? So there were all these different things which we needed. I, I wanted to make sure that we don't keep hammering the Postgres database. Then we are like, OK, uh, like how do you create this Bloom filter? How do you decide when a domain is trusted, when a domain is not trusted? So there were all these different things. And then the another part was like, OK, I downloaded the code right now. It's done. I have bro, I have all this heuristic. I started. There is no reputation. There is no intelligence bro has right now. So bro would generate alert for everything. So you need to create this reputation database. So I, I said, OK, let's have a Python script, which actually goes back last 30 days of bro logs, parses them, creates this reputation database. Uh, populates Postgres and then when you start bro first time it's bro is all ready bro says I know all the history of this for at least a month I can actually be productive day one instead of like letting bro run for two weeks three weeks to create its own state so this this actually kind of gives you a back uh, uh, like a back channel uh, help to bro so but then there were all these like uh, challenges so uh, I actually like I goofed a big time when uh, actually part of uh, my goof of uh, actually Johanna is responsible too. So uh, what happened is when I was dealing with Postgres, um, uh, I would say, OK, this is the new domain. Let's put an insert. The reason is because I could not do an update. Bro, Postgres communication never needed updates. There was no update feature. So Johanna is like, I can put update, but I should put absurd. So if you, you actually. Uh, see if there is a record already there, then you update it. If it's not there, you insert it. So that feature is there. I haven't implemented it yet inside the Crow code. And then there were operational problems. Like I think right now, like one, like one of our cluster, which runs 50 workers, actually goes to 50, 400 GB in the process size. I have no idea. But our other cluster works perfectly well. It has been running steadily for one month. I haven't restarted it. And it actually was doing 7 GB on manager and 2 GB on the workers. So, so there are challenges and stuff. So now, how is it working for LBL? So here is some promising results. So, and I swear, I did not know of this one. I got a phishing email the day I was flying here. And it said, uh, performance review problem. And I'm like, finally, they caught on me. <laughs> so. Uh, I was nervous, OK, there is going to be no raise this year. So what do I do? So I click on that URL. Uh, and uh, But yeah, this was there. And I, actually, yeah, it was on 1241. I was in the flight that time. So, so I click on the URL. So, But I went to and looked into Bro. So we had all the URLs. This was the URL. This was actually the entire specific details. And then uh, these were the alerts. And I swear you not when I was grappling on this my palms were sweating because if I would not have caught this I would not have been talking here so 
but uh, but yeah, we had a rare URL click where it's this is the URL, this was the email, this was the subject, this was to me, and this is entire story here. But then there was a historically new attacker because uh, Ingrid Peters did not have reputation in our reputation database. It was a phishing email. And turns out actually, and then this, this thing, I, I think it, you might not see, but this was aware, I actually was logging in via my VPN. So we actually, this was my VPN address from hotel room where I clicked on this thing. So, but here are more example alerts. So this one actually is a similar thing. I, I just crafted these so that uh, I can save the privacy for people. But uh, this is the SMTP record where Frank Zumeda actually sent this email. There was this domain here involved. This was the URL here. So I, I came across this little problem where, you know, this is a legitimate alert. This is a phishing email. But if there are 10 URLs in that email and they like all of them get clicked on, there would be 10 alerts. And that was like, nah, this, this defies the purpose. So I created this one more like a hack into notice framework where it would actually like aggregate all these URLs together for each HTTP session and SMTP and then just send one email. So I would compress these 10 emails into one email and that way it was like more of a summary alert which we would get. Uh, it's a different story that uh, I hard coded my email address in there and that got into problem. I got 15,000 emails because of that. But uh, so, so, so the deal here is, uh, I broke this entire talk into two parts. One of them was the visibility part, which is SMTP URL analysis. That's a bro package, you can install it. It should work pretty stable. I, I can tell you, if not, let me know. But the other part is where the credential spare phishing reputation database, uh, things are working pretty well there. That's how uh, we were able to create these alerts. And uh, this one here, uh, this is working steadily. But the deal is, I was using this old parametric logic. I need to implement DAS. And uh, I think I should be able to get that going in the next two, three weeks. And once that is there, I would make that package ready as well. But for that package, you will have dependencies of Postgres. You will have to run Postgres, which is simple, straightforward. I'll try to make sure that the documentation works better. I actually spend more time writing documentation than the bro policy. Uh, and I, I know why these guys actually uh, tell me, like, I, I can see the suffering of Seth, Robin, and bro team. Because releasing something for others is like 1,000 times more difficult than just writing for yourself. So, but uh, again, we are hiring. If this makes you excited, apply. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm open for questions too, if you have any other questions or anything. I know that was too much information, but this is only one hour I get in a year where I can just throw everything out. So, yes. Are you thinking of making a whitelist for URLs that you just don't want to process anymore? Actually, it's an idea. I don't know good idea or not until I like try it out. Generally, what I have found is like whitelisting is painful because it, you continuously need to maintain it. So if there is a feed of whitelist where somebody vouches for it, I would actually don't mind actually putting it in. But uh, uh, I would think like of 600,000 URLs a day, which we see, I mean, 99.999% would be candidate for whitelisting. So I think uh, energy spent in trying to figure out badness based on like reputation of the domains, which is what generally attackers do. They try to create, like they won't write a phishing, uh, web, create a phishing website at lbl.gov. It's going to be lbl.gov.zimdo.com. So I think that's where energy spent is better. Yes? Actually, uh, I can. Oh, we're gonna publish here. Oh, you are okay. Yeah. So this is shortcut. But uh, if you like search for Usenix and Grant Ho, you will find it. So. Thank you. No, that was a question. Okay. Yes, Jim. Uh, Shish, uh, uh, Bloom filters have a, uh, a known false positive uh, percentage. Uh, how do you deal with that? So, so I went to extremes for that. Actually, at one point I said, okay, let's put a billion elements in Bloom filter, 
and l let's put a false positive rate of like 10 to the power minus 7. Turns out when you restart Bro, it takes a long time to create that bloom filter and then it, it, it's actually pretty big. Matthias gave me a script which actually can, like uh, gives me the size of bloom filter if you put right parameters. So I actually kept trying like and then I tried little extremes where I would say okay 100,000 elements in bloom filter with false positive rate of 1. So what, how would that work? And so I think it, uh, like after this experimentation, I just like came up with like, okay, we see 600,000 URLs a day. We have six months of data. Let's just have like N million elements in Bloom filter with false positive of 0 0.01. Actually, th the way I decide false positive is actually function of like how long bro takes to restart after that. If it's painfully longer, I reduce it by one order of magnitude. So. Mathias gave me that script. It actually was the scientific way to do it. But I think when you're restarting Bro many times, you just like start changing parameters. You, you can also add that you don't, these are not automatically responded to. So an occasional false positive is not a big deal. Right. Yes. Hi, Ashish. <clears throat> um, correct me if I'm wrong in this. Uh, to make sure I understand. So, so uh, the user gets a phishing email, he clicks on the link. He goes to the web page and types in his uh, credentials, which generates this alert in Bro. So you've got the alerts in there; you can see it. But is it? It's a race at this point. The criminal's got the password, and you have the alert, and it's a race to see who can change the password first. Oh yeah, how that's you, true. But how do you address? You, how do you try to win that race? No, no. Actually, I think I mean. Let's say we always lose that race. They actually change the password. They, what they do is they don't change the password. They would log into the account and then they would use the account to send emails right. to So you have to change it before he logs in. Yes. So we would do that immediately. If as soon as we would just see an alert and if it's actually, uh, I mean, there has been a few times where I actually message Jay, like this is DEF CON 3, DEF CON 1, depending on the alert. Yes. Uh, yes. But uh, most of the time, I think we have been like, there is little leeway between logging in uh, like giving up URL, like I think the uh, shortest time we have seen is about six minutes. But most of the time it's actually longer than that. By that time we are actually able to RPG the domains. And actually our user base, we have to give them a lot of credit. They would like be at lab at 6.30 in the morning and they would immediately report. So sometimes we look at the alert after we look at their notification. So actually not sometimes, more often than not that's what we would actually see. So that help, kind of helps too. You can also add that you've got, because you have such extensive visibility, you can you can know with confidence this didn't go anywhere. Yes, yes. Yeah, like, yeah, we know, like, based on, uh, uh, like, uh, all the Google authentication data, based on uh, uh, even DNS, like, okay, how many uh, individual machines did the DNS look up for this domain? So there is all these different things. That kind of gives us a fairly decent idea, like, okay, who fell for it, who did not fall for it, who actually clicked on it but did not enter the credentials. Yeah, so you've got these different detectors, like, oh, it's a, a rare URL, or it's a rare send to or from address. There's a sort of list of all these features that might plausibly explain why this is a, a phishing email. I wonder if you have any sense of what are the most powerful features Obviously, you're going to combine them, and that's where all the it comes to. But is it is it mostly because it's a rare URL? Is it mostly because it's a uh, 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 rare send to or receive from? Uh, you know, what is the relative weight? You know, I know that you haven't implemented, for example, the machine learning thing that combines these features. But do you have a sense of what's going to be more powerful? You want? I would say it really is constellation that that, that there's not enough power without that. We might be able to lose one of them, and we've done a little bit of sensitivity analysis on that, but you really want all of them in the final version, which differs from what uh, Ashish put up there. Well, thanks for all the patience. I know talk after lunch and with so much information, it's hard. But uh, thank you so much for listening. So.